my high school posted a video clip from one of our marching band shows on Facebook. And despite the fact that we were incredibly out of tune that night, and happened to seem a little bit less grand than I remember, <laughs> within 24 hours, her post had yielded 16 comments and a whole slew of likes. Social media and its prevalence in our lives keeps on growing and increasing. Statistics that I can find on how much time is spent in the U.S. on social media vary, but they are all mind-numbingly large. Some said seven or eight hours per month, some 15 hours per month, and that's average over the entire population. I recall having heard that those in my age bracket spend about an hour and a half each day on Facebook. I'm not sure whether I believe that number or not, but it's still a lot of time. It brings one to wonder what's driving it? What's the pull to spend so much of our lives on, and this is not an exclusive list, Facebook, on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, and all the rest. Now, I like to think it's about relationships, it's about connecting, finding care and celebration with those who are special to us. And that's certainly a topic for another day. But I think there's other stuff there, too. Driving the need to post both our big grand events and also our little easy ones, like an attitude marching band. I wonder perhaps how much is driven by a desire to see you exceptional, perhaps a sense of desperation. How many of us at some level are afraid of just being ordinary, of not being memorable or of dying without leaving some sort of a legacy? This is a fear that certainly has some current day manifestations. On Facebook alone, one source said, there are 70 billion pieces of content shared each month. That's billion with a B. 70 billion updates on what's happening in our lives. That's a lot of putting little bits of our lives into public. Maybe on some level saying, hey, look, I'm unique. I am somebody. I think the drive to feel like one is exceptional has been around for quite a while, in fact. When I was in high school, each year I looked ahead in the yearbook at the seniors, especially those who had been named as one of those superlatives, most likely to succeed and all the other most likely they come up with. We had more than 20 different ones, and that was in my class of only 95 people. <laughs> What superlative I was going to get named? Which one best fit me? Is it no, not that one? No, not that one? Well, as it turned out, none of them. I was destined to be just another ordinary graduating senior. So I heard a good explanation of this desire to be exceptional a couple of years later from a dungeon master who was trying to teach a group of us how to play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> So to start the game, we each had to build our characters. We picked out what we would be, we rolled for our abilities and our talents. So after we did this, and had our nice little charts on paper, she told us to pick one of our abilities, and she would increase it significantly. In our fantasies, she said, we all want to be heroes. Why play the game if you can't be one there, too? because we all want to be exceptional heroes. I forgot what ability I chose at the time, but I do remember it was fun thinking it. <laughs> so here I was, I was all set to be an exceptional hero, but I never got the chance to use my new heroic <laughs> abilities. Due to some probably familiar sounding scheduling constraints, the group was only able to get together a few times. So here we were all decked out to be our new heroic selves on our new heroic quest. And the most heroic things that one of us got to do 
was to use their increased agility to catch a falling bowl of soup. <laughs> so instead, we got to do all sorts of completely ordinary sounding things. Walk down this road, decide which way to turn, stop at this tavern for a meal, talk to this person, fill up our water, yeah, to be sure we had fun together. But it was just being ordinary together. Our quest for the times we met was just a sum of many small, ordinary actions and decisions. I think of how much this parallels life, that our journey is a sum of our everyday, usually pretty ordinary actions. One of my personal practices that I've engaged in for years look at some, looks at some of these sums for ordinary things for myself. I'd probably go so far as to call it a spiritual practice for myself, since it constantly raises mindfulness for me, reminds me of my interconnections with the earth. This practice is ecological footprinting. You'll probably hear me bring it up again every time, too. It's a fairly simple concept that also appeals to my mathematical side. Ecological footprinting, it's a process that uses a variety of tools to calculate one's own personal footprint. Literally, the amount of the Earth's resources that are impacted or consumed because of the needs or lifestyles of a person. It's going through a whole bunch of calculations to figure out how much of the Earth is impacted just because of me. To me, it's a very tangible and uniform way to look at a wide variety of things that aren't really quite so tangible and to add them all up together. So there are a couple ways to do this. There's a paper-based version, where you get out the calculator and actually write it down. And then there are these internet-based versions to that you can use to calculate the footprint. One of my favorites is a website that walks you through a number of different areas, like your diet, type of house, recycling, waste habits, transportation. I try to tell the truth, but sometimes I fudge a little bit. So then it calculates the equivalent of how many acres of the earth it takes to support my own choices and practices about each of these things. So the fun thing about this website is that you get to create this little on-screen avatar of yourself. <laughs> I'm kind of partial to the green hair option for this. You pick the hair, you pick the skin, you pick the shirt, the pants. And then she walks around as the representations of the user's choices fall from the sky with a satisfying thud. <laughs> I answer the questions about meat and dairy and processed versus unprocessed food, and then my avatar narrowly misses a produce store that crashes down beside her. <laughs> thud. I answer questions about how much I recycle, and a trash and recycling bin thump right next to her. It's quite satisfying visually, the answer, not so much, but visually it's quite satisfying. And if I want more detail or to be able to be a little more specific with my answers, there's always the possibility of calculating it longhand, which I try to do at least once every year or two. The vast majority of these questions are about small, ordinary actions, not grand things that are obvious. Small, ordinary things like how much milk and eggs do you consume in a week? How much chicken? What's your monthly electrical bill? And for the ultra-specific calculations, how long do you take showers for, new or used books, and how many pounds of books do you purchase per month? It's usually hard for me to think about any of these questions on a larger scale than just the impact of what's sitting in front of me. Footprint calculations help to open that up for me. They create the grand scale where I can see my tiny, ordinary choices. And then it says, look, this one regular choice added up over all this time. It makes this much <laughs> difference. Our ordinary choices matter. They matter in and of themselves and the impact they have. And they make manifest our deeply held beliefs and values. Our actions show us our beliefs. So let me ground this in some of Aristotle's thoughts to go back to the ways. 
He had a particular understanding of virtue. The practice of virtue, Aristotle claimed, was found through the habits that affect an individual's action. To him, virtue is seen and developed by acting regularly in tiny ways, those ordinary things. It's not that I believe this great, big, great, big, grand thing, and that's why I'm making a choice. It's the other way around. Through this ordinary, everyday choice, we can see our motivating beliefs. I think we can see this in Unitarian Universalist theology also, and definitely in ethics grounded in Unitarian Universalism. You, you, theology would say that action is paramount. One's underlying beliefs and personal credo are all well and good, but as you use, we get to you, as you use, we get to form these for ourselves. But it's our actions are where our beliefs take form. Our actions are what make manifest our beliefs and our values. And without actions, all the belief in the world doesn't make. A difference. One of the ways that I understand the world is in terms of performance, of identities being performed. These are identities like gender identities, religious identities, relational identities, racial identities, class identities, all of these identities. In this way of thinking, we only see in others and how they're performed by that person, how the identity is manifested by that person's actions. I could go on about this for a while, but what I want to extend it to is that with this performance-based view of the world, I want to say that values are performed also. That values don't even exist until they're performed. So these actions that perform and manifest our values don't have to be greatly graded actions, not by any means. Aristotle would say they're not. They're actions that may seem invisible things that are ordinary and overlooked. They're the stuff that make up our days, that can be just as heroic as the moments of grandness that make headlines. But some of these moments, these ordinary moments, can happen in unlikely places, too. A colleague shared a story about her own experience of commuting across the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. So it's a toll bridge, and since she didn't have the West Coast equivalent of the Easy Pass electronic toll collection device, she had to wait in line each time for one of the toll takers when she went across. Now, at this bridge, one of these lines was typically a lot longer than the others. So sometimes she waited this one, and sometimes she'd go through one of the shorter ones. The reason this particular line was longer was that all these regulars through the toll plaza, they wanted to wait for that particular toll taker. She knew many of them by name. And so each day they shared, little by little, the bits of their lives as they went through and paid her their toll. One day, as my friend was waiting in this toll taker's line, she saw something happen she'd never before seen at a toll plaza. The door of the toll booth opened, the toll taker came out, as did the driver of the car, and they embraced. A warm, heartfelt embrace amidst all these waiting cars. My friend pulled up to the toll booth a few cars later. What happened, she asked. Oh, her husband just died. She's been going back and forth across this bridge for months to visit him in the hospital. What a precious time the two of them had shared in that ordinary moment of just paying a toll and asking her how she would do it each day. All of these tiny, ordinary moments added up to a relationship that made a difference for that particular woman. And many more, too, given the ongoing length of her toll booth's line. The ordinary moment and ordinary conversations they had had added up to be quite grand and meaningful. I'm brought back to the soup cafe from today's story. How much more basic and ordinary can lunch get than one choice of soup, or yesterday's leftover, and a roll to go with it? And yet the moments of calm and caring carved out by this woman's soup ministry are many. Ordinary, yes, but I'll also call them heroic.
intentional. So first of all, being ordinary, it just gets invisible to me. I don't notice it anymore because it's just part of the everyday noise. And I'm on autopilot flies right on by. And even more, I want to see the result. Not seeing immediate progress can derail me, make me devalue what I'm doing, even make me give up. Perhaps a bit too much, I like seeing tangible progress on a short-term scale. I like to see that what I'm doing is changing something. So even with all of my fabulous ecological footprint calculations, sometimes, more than sometimes, it's still hard for me to imagine the big picture. Because it's so easy to get attached to seeing progress. So there's a sweet little poem by Madero Overstreet that helps to counter this attachment and its companion despair for me. Despair at not seeing a difference. So this poem is addressed to one who doubts the worth of doing anything if you can't do everything. You say the little efforts that I make will do no good. That they will never prevail to tip the hovering scale where justice hangs in balance. I don't think I ever thought they would. But I am prejudiced beyond debate in favor of my right to choose which side shall feel the stubborn ounces of my weight. Well, stubbornness, I've got plenty of that. <laughs> It's not really a cure for my attachment to seeing progress, but maybe a place for me to start. The stubbornness of believing that it does make a difference, and the stubbornness to keep reminding myself of that fact, too. Ordinary heroism doesn't make the news. It doesn't look like it changes the world. It may not look like it changes much at all, at least not in the moment. But taking a step back, the world is mostly filled with just ordinary people and their ordinary actions every day. And the ordinary, just being ordinary, that's where most of change happens. So may you find and cherish many fabulous, plain old ordinary moments as you go about each ordinary day. Our ordinary can truly be extraordinary. May it be so. So how much more ordinary does it get than just a single step? Please rise now in body and spirit and let's sing together for one six